to satisfy our quest for knowing God. Now after many millennia, mankind is more at a loss to the nature of God. In fact, it appears that the tools we created to help us find God serve more as obstacles and hindrances. Those obstacles now stand between God and us. We extend to you an invitation to join Master Eric and Omkar for the weekly program Between God and Us every Sunday evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. exclusively on Sankia Television Between God and Us Knowledge to Free Your Soul Good evening and welcome to the program Between God and Us Last week, we covered a very interesting topic, which was debt. Today, we are covering, well, we are extending that topic into what happens when the soul leaves the body and what happens on the, the journey. And I sit once again with Master Eric, who is going to shed some light on this very, let's say, interesting, but less spoken of topic. Well, first of all, nice to be here with you, Omkar. And I want to say Sitaram, Assalamu Alaikum, Sai Ram, and good evening, everyone. Yeah, you know, when we talked about death, then the next question comes up. We were talking about death is birth. Right. So, how does the soul depart the body? Do you go straight up right away? Or... Is there a journey? Is there decisions to be made? Right? I covered a lot of this in the satsang that I did down south. Yeah. But a lot of people didn't watch that. So hopefully they'll get a little bit more information. Today, everybody, I'm not going to talk just about Hinduism. I'm going to talk about the Muslim Quran. And I'm also going to talk about the Christian Bible. So what is the dream? What happens when your soul leaves the body? Now, in the Christian faith, it's very vague. Mm. They believe that when you die, it doesn't talk about the journey of the soul. It doesn't talk about departing and things like that. It just says, once you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you'll have a home. You can go to your home in heaven. Okay. So it's very vague. Now, the only thing that in the Bible, when it talks about the end day, which I do want to do, what is the final tribulation on that last day? That'll be a whole other program. Okay. But in Hinduism and Muslim, in Hinduism, when the body departs, when the soul departs your body, it states that the orb of your soul, the light mm -hmm. of your soul, is approximately about the size of your thumbnail Okay. when it comes out. Now, it goes into specific details. Now, when the soul does depart the body immediately it has what you call semi-divine sight now what that means omkar is that all your relatives people that was close to you no matter where they live in the world you can see them at one time okay semi-divine sight so haven't you heard people, I know you've heard people, and people listening, you've heard them. They stated by the time the person died, whether it was at home, hospital, or whatever, somebody has seen the outline, or they said they came and visited them. They saw them briefly. Yeah. So, the soul can visit 
the people who it chooses to see mm -hmm. to let them know that he's okay. A lot of times at the beginning when the soul leaves the body, and I'll explain why in a minute, you may see them, but they won't talk. Okay. They, they, they might do hand gestures or anything like that, but they won't talk immediately after they die. Now, the reason is when the orb, the soul leaves the body, mm -hmm. size of your thumbnail, there's a waiting period after the cremation or burial in other face. Now, in Hinduism, you have the Bandara. Then you have other rituals after the Bandara that you will give the deceased up to a year for the yearly prayers. Yeah. And then some carried on with ancestral prayers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, during the time of the Bandara in Hinduism, when the soul leaves the body, it starts to enter what, it, what is called the astral body, the astral form of you, whoever died. Okay? Now, it takes a certain amount of time for that astral form to be complete. So, by the time the Bandara is done, the astral form is almost complete. Then it can go on its journey. So the question is, why would the soul wait? That's what a lot of people ask me. Well, in Hinduism, there's certain rituals that have to be done I'm not thinking to release that body. Before you get into that, the rituals, I think, in, you know, like in the last episode, you said dying is boot, right? I think in that period from the person, leave, the soul leaving the body till the Bandara period is like the pregnancy period for preparing the astral body for it's the It's just soul. like if a baby's growing, yeah, and the, womb. the astral body has to form. It's a, a gestation period where this, the body of the soul, the astral body is being formed for the soul to go in, on its journey. Right. Now, I don't want people to be under the misconception. I said it's entering the astral form. Right. The astral form is not pure. It's still holding on to the sheaths Right. of your human body around the soul. Okay? So I'm going to get to that in a minute. So the soul in the astral body still has desires and is like a personality. It's a transition from the human body yeah. to the astral body. So I'm going to explain as we go. Okay, okay. Now, one thing that people need to understand, and the reason I said they, if they come to you, it ain't going to be everybody, mm -hmm. but if they come to you after they die, and I said they don't speak, they'll do hand gestures. The reason is sometimes, remember, only the personality goes with the soul. Everything else, the brain and everything else stays here. Some people, when they die, especially if it was an untimely death, or an accidental death, that soul is confused. Sometimes it takes a while for that soul to understand that they're dead. Mm -hmm. But they can see you, but right. you can't see them. So they're trying to get your attention, mm -hmm. but if they visit someone, they're trying through hand motions or whatever to, to let you, them know you're okay, but he's wanting to see if you can see them. Okay? Now, 
when the body is forming the astral body and it starts its journey after the rituals are done, okay? Now you're still going to continue rituals of giving the umbrella, the clothes, the food, the water, shoes, you know, and we're going to go over why yeah. in Hinduism that it it still has, and I want people to understand, obstacles to go through. It still has, you have to go through three worlds. Mm -hmm. And then you understand why you need to feed the birds, why you're alive now. There's a lot of different things that we should do while we're alive, okay? To clear your path when you go. But as the astral body starts to travel, mm -hmm. now, it says in the scriptures in Hinduism, in the Garuda Puran, Mahapuram, that you're going to come to a fork, fork in the road. And the fork of the road, there are two tunnels, two paths. One is dark, one is light. One is named Shreya, one is named Preya. And you have to make a choice. Which one are you going to go? Are you going into the tunnel of light or are you going into the tunnel of darkness? Now that's still your free will of choice. What you're going to go through. But you're going to see like a path wherever all the souls are taken, right? So, before you get to that point, this is why knowledge and spiritualism is so important. It's critical. Because in spirituality, things are reversed. So, you dream a wedding, that's death. You dream birth, that's a new beginning. Right? Right? So, in spirituality, now I'm not trying to sway how people's going to make their decision, but the question was asked to me, what would I choose? And I said, I'm going to choose the dark path. Because darkness will lead to light. Light leads to darkness. So, now a lot of people will say, but we heard people when they died momentarily, they saw this bright light. But I said, but what they didn't say is right when they died, they saw darkness. And then they witnessed the bright light coming. Right? So a lot of people, they have a misconception because the knowledge isn't coming out. Right? Then, after you make your journey through Shreya and Preya, now you come to the Valley of the Dead. And the astral body starts to enter the Valley of the Dead. Now in there, picture the letter Z. You call it Z down here. But up there we say Z, the letter Z. Mm -hmm. That's how the energy is. It's zigzagging like this. So when the soul enters the Valley of the Dead, the energies are shifting to centralize the soul within you. And then in the shifting of energy, that's when the sheaths that is around your soul is being peeled off. And the sheaths, picture an artichoke. You know how you hold it and rip this one down, this one down, this one down, this one okay, down. Okay, Trinidadian, they could picture like a, um, like a scythe. You could. Yeah. Uh, well, they don't have artichoke down here, so plenty of people right. would know what it is. <laughs> so, as you're peeling the scythe, Okay, 
Now, once the soul is released of the earthly sheaths that surrounded the soul, and it gets through the valley of the dead, that's when purification starts. Now, as the astral form hits the, the wall of purification, that's when your astral body starts to change. And it's going to start to change into the spiritual body. So there's a difference between the transition of the body to the astral form and from the astral form to the spiritual body. All right. So that doesn't take place here. Um, the reason I'm asking is because... Okay, no, it doesn't take place here. In, in terms of your talk about the Bandara and stuff like that, just for a timeline, not for in terms of the event, right? The soul has already left here and gone to arrive at the Valley of the Dead. No. The body will not start its journey. In most cases, there are exceptions. Right until the rites are complete. Okay. Okay? Then it will go. But so like for Christians as an example and the Muslims and other faiths that don't do the, the rituals like the Hindus, what happens? Well, remember I grew up as a Christian. Right. Right? And they believe that once you have the funeral, the preacher says the scriptures, now, Catholic is different. They'll have incense and they have some rituals to do before they actually go bury you. Right. But the Protestants, a lot of the Protestants, especially in the States, they don't really have a ritual. They have the burial, they'll read the Bible passages, and then they put you in the ground. Now, in Christians, they're confused. I was confused. You're talking about the Protestants. Right. Right. Of what happens after death, because we're not really told. They just say, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have a home in heaven. Right. Well, that's iffy. Because when you get baptized, you're accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And at that time, at that exact moment, it is stated that your sins, Jesus removes the sins from you. And you have a home in heaven. That's true. But it doesn't mean after you get baptized, you can go out back to your old ways and start sinning and doing everything you did before you got baptized. So now you're creating that karma we was talking about. Yeah. So it might be iffy, okay? A lot of people aren't told that. They just say, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have a home in heaven, okay? But after you get baptized, you may not be perfect, but you start living a better life, okay? But your actions is what dictates where you go. Yeah. And that's what's so important, people. We don't have to be like a preacher, a pundit, or an imam, yeah. but we could be good people yeah. and help people. But even in that sense, you're talking about not lying, not stealing, not coveting thy neighbor, even right. which is general. No, that's everybody doing that. And like I said, they go by the Ten Commandments. Right. But in some beliefs, and we got to have this show, Omkar, because it's going to blow your mind. Some beliefs have 613 commandments. Okay, they've regulated clear down into human life, everyday life, what we should do and what we should not do. Okay. What is classed as a sin and what is not. Yeah. So that's an interesting subject. Now, a lot of people, as you go through and you're entering and the sheets is peeled off, now you're going into the spiritual body. Now, a lot of people in Hinduism, when a person dies, you know, you do everything with the kush grass and everything with Lord Krishna, mm -hmm. you know, and then you offer the umbrella 
you offer the shoes, you offer the clothes, and there's other items, right? I don't have enough time to cover everything. Yeah. Now, any gold on ceremony you talk about? Pardon? Any gold on ceremony or any funeral? You know, when when they offer. Now, some offer at different times. It depends which pundit and what. Now, I was always shown that they do it when you're doing that first kush grass for Lord Krishna. Okay. Okay. Now, the reason you offer the umbrella, it states when the soul is on its journey, it goes through intense heat. You know how our sun has one ray? Yeah. One big ray? It says the sun's suns, the heat is equivalent to seven rays of light. Okay. That's extreme heat. All right. So now you offered the umbrella. So now that he can use the umbrella or she to kind of shield themselves from the sun rays. Mm -hmm. Okay? You offer the water for when they get thirsty. You offer the food because he's still on his journey or she. Mm -hmm. You offer the, the shoes. Why? You have to go through the thorns. So you're giving him com more comfort of walking over the thorns to where he needs to go. You offer the clothes for when he goes through the period of coldness. So I don't know if this stuff has been explained to people, but these are why you give certain offerings. Yeah. Other beliefs don't do that. Well, that's what I was just thinking. Like, Only Hindus. That's what I was asking about the Christian. Um, Buddhist, some Buddhist sects. Now it's S-E-C-T-S. -E yeah. They do similar, but not all Buddhists. Okay? Okay. Now Buddhism and Hinduism is very similar mm -hmm. in what they do, and also Tibetans. So this is what happens. Now, there are scholars that say that when you're on your journey, your life passes in front of you. What you've done, good and bad. Mm -hmm. And it continuously recycles and replays everything that you've done. So if you did a lot of bad things, it's going to repeat and show you all the bad things. Now, that's where in spiritualism, they reference to the lucid self. Now, in the lucid self, let me explain that, everybody. Picture yourself in a theater. You bought the ticket. Now, you'll probably want to get some Gigi fruits, Coke, popcorn, whatever. Now, you go. Now, in referencing the lucid self, you're going to set direct, direct center of that movie theater. Yeah. Now, the movie theater is jam-packed with the people, not a seat left. So you're eating your popcorn, and the credits start. Now, when the credits start, <laughs> you're sitting there saying, and the movie kicks up, you're like, that's not the movie I've paid for. You know what's playing on that screen with all these witnesses? Your life. Everything you've done in life, it's playing on the screen. So a lot of people don't talk about the lucid self. But even in the Christian Bible and many beliefs, the terminology is different, but the, the theory is the same. It states that as we live throughout our life, we are viewed, viewed from above as a spectacle. Now, the old word spectacle back then 
meant theater witnessed by a bunch of spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. So do people realize that when you're doing everything, when you're alone, you say, hmm, I could do this. Nobody's seeing me. Well, there are witnesses seeing what we do every day. So now that information is being accumulated by, in the Christian faith, they call it the life chart, our record. Right. In Hinduism, they call it the Akashic records. That is everything, what we've done good and bad, ready for when we get judged. So as we go on the journey, you That's also got to go so through about, three worlds. Go ahead. question there, right? So that is something that exists outside the memory that you will have as the soul? No. The soul is a particle of God, correct? Okay. It's not you. Anytime people try to identify themselves as their soul right. is a fool. Because if you believe in reincarnation, Okay. Our, our object during this lifetime is to connect with our soul, connect direct with God, okay. right? But how many people do that, Omkar? You're living your everyday life. You got your job, your family, your kids, everything else. Right. Right? So the soul is like an independent of you within you. So it's documenting everything you do, storing everything that you're doing, right? And it's relaying to the Akashic Records. Okay. A lot of people don't talk about it. Some beliefs say, in the Muslim faith, they say you have two angels on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. And one is dictating writing down everything bad you're doing and one is writing everything good you're doing then those transcripts are loaded right as you do it so it's similar right but a little variation right now so don't think the reason is if you believe in reincarnation and let's say you were reborn 500 times as an example. Every time was a different body, mm -hmm. a different personality, different family you're in, mm -hmm. but your soul, your soul remains the same. Okay. So you cannot, we cannot in this body from the human side, say that we are automatically that soul. We are the body that carries the soul within us during this lifetime. Okay. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So I don't want people to get confused. Our objective during this lifetime isn't just to read scriptures. It's to learn how to make a direct connect with your soul and God, which the soul is a part of God. And you could get your guidance, your directives, direct. You don't need other humans to tell you what to do and when to do it. You follow what they're saying yeah. once you make that connection. So some scholars say that it takes approximately a year to go on your journey to your final destination, mm -hmm. okay? Other beliefs think it happens instantly. So let me give you an example. In the Muslim faith, they believe in the seven realms just like Hindus, right? They just don't break down, and a lot of people in Hinduism don't know, 
that in each realm there's nine different stages. So if you went to heaven, realm four, that's the lowest heaven. There's nine different stages, nine levels. Yeah. Then you go to realm five, nine levels. And documented, they know that there's other realms above seven. But a lot of scholars say no human has ever seen it through meditation or otherwise. Okay, and maybe that's done on purpose. Just like people say if there's reincarnation, a lot of, a lot of questions come up and they state, why don't we remember our last life? Why? Well, the reason is, if God wanted you to remember, you would remember. Yeah, you're, supposed, you're supposed to be born because you made a promise to God what you're going to complete during this lifetime. Right. You're supposed to recognize in time what your true purpose is. Fresh. So why do we now, forget that? Now some people... Why do we forget that? You know they say, you know... Um, I because saw that, I saw it if you knew... They say oh, this thing on your lip is when the angels put their finger so you forget. You ever hear that one? Yeah, I've heard a lot of old tales. Yeah. No, but why, why do we the forget? The only thing that was confirmed is that when a baby is born, they say the baby remembers its past life only up to the time that the soft spot on the head hardens okay and then there's no memory right of it if you knew what you did good and bad in your last life don't you think that might alter and change maybe the choices you're making during this life with your free will of choice uh -huh. in the conditions you're in yeah do you think that maybe Knowing what you did, which could have been terrible, might traumatize you in this life? Yeah. I yeah. want you to think about yeah. it. Yeah. God has his reasons why we cannot remember our past life if you believe in reincarnation. Yeah. Now, in the Muslim faith, they say when you die, now, I'm going to summarize, but I'm quoting from the Quran. Okay. It states that when you die, the Lord of death sets at the head, right at the head of you. The messengers of the Lord of death, the dark ones, mm -hmm. what you were talking about, also is around you. And if you're a good soul, the messengers and the Lord of death will say, come, come you good soul. Come to the golden gates and the paradise of Allah. And you peacefully leave the body and they escort you up. And as they um, escort you up, there's spiritual beings that are witnessing this. And they'll say, who is this good soul? The good smelling soul. And the messengers and Lord of death will say, his name was such and such. He's the son of such and such. And the father of such and such. Mm -hmm. And they say, please go. And they're being witnessed all the way up. It's very peaceful. And they said they will reach the golden gates of Allah. And the gates will be open. And you're allowed in. So doesn't that kind of change the theory of what I'm going to say, what the scholars say at the end of the show? That you've already been judged by the time you got to the gates. 
the gates are open. Right? All right. And then the soul, after judgment and you entered, comes straight back to the grave. Now, if you're a vile soul in the Muslim faith, it states, when you die, the Lord of death is sitting at your head. The messengers are standing around you. And the soul is quivering. It's scared. It doesn't want to leave that body. And it states that the messengers of Lord of death will rip the soul out of the body and beat the soul on its journey. And they're torturing and beating that soul. And the spiritual bodies will say, what is that foul smell? Who is this vile soul? And they state, this is the son of such and such, the father of such and such. And as they're wit witnessing up, and he gets to the gates, the gates are locked. He can't enter. And in the Quran, it has one of the best statements I've, I've seen in every religion. Mm -hmm. And Allah stated that when a vile soul comes to the gates of heaven, he may enter when a camel can fit through the eye of a needle. Now, when would that ever happen? Never. never. <laughs> but I love the terminology. You understand? There's no choice. Now, in both cases, they state all of this happens. Now, if you go to a Muslim funeral, they'll have the funeral. Then they take the body to the cemetery. And it's very simple. They don't have elaborate coffins and things like that. Yeah. Then they'll set the body down, prepare the body, and throw five... You know, there's other things they do, but then they throw five handfuls of dirt into the grave. Right. Then they start covering the grave. Let me tell you something. This says everything happens by the time you hear the people walk away from the grave. Right that fast that's in the muslim faith right then in the christian faith some christians state that when you die your soul your soul stays here okay until the second coming of christ and they say he will liberate all his children yeah up to heaven Right? Okay. But there's scholars that argue that point. And they state, if you're judged and you go, and he says you're allowed to heaven, why would you come back to the body when the body is rottening and, you know, wasting away? Because the soul is supposed to be pure. This is the argument that people no, have. No, I'm thinking if they're saying. So how could the soul stay with a decaying body? You know, you're either judged to heaven or hell. This is what the Christian scholars are saying. Yeah. So if you're judged to hell and they're stating that you will stay in hell for eternity. So does that in turn, in, ter, in, in eternity start from the time you're dead and you're judged or by the time the second resurrection, when the resurrection happens from Jesus? Well, that's what I think. And that confusion. See, there's confusion. <laughs> yeah. And the reason there's confusion is because knowledge isn't given out. Yeah, but even the whole concept of sinning, if you're saying, okay, you stay here until the second coming of Christ, mm -hmm. then you don't have sin. You just 
when you die, you stay here until Christ come and he'll liberate you and carry you to heaven. So you have no sin in then? I think the interpretation of when Christ comes back to kill the Antichrist. Right. Or in the Muslim faith, they don't call it the Antichrist. They call it the Dijel. Right. Okay. So when that time comes, and then I don't want to give it away because we're going to do a show on it. Yeah. But that's when you learn about the four horsemen. Okay. What color is the four horsemen? What is their job on earth before Jesus comes? Right? So the book of Revelation talks in that pretty de in depth. Right. And we'll go into that. Go you, ahead. Had, you had mentioned something that some faiths say that it's instant. And the, for example, um, the Hindus say that it takes a year. I think it might. Up to a year. Up to a year. Now, I think if it, you're a super spiritual good soul, it's stated that you can be escorted right. by a deity. So that's like first class in an airplane. Yeah. You're being treated a certain way because of your devotion, your belief, the way you lived in life, how you help uplift humanity. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different criteria which accumulate to give you a certain status. Yeah. Well, what I'm thinking is the timeline, it might be a misinterpretation if you're thinking the metric, the, the metrics that they use. If you use God time, then the journey is instant. The, per, the per, um, Puranic timetables, what we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, but if you use human time, then, uh, yeah. But if you're using God's time, the journey is instant. instant. Right. So this is what I'm bringing across. What does this belief say? What does this belief say? What does this one say? Yeah. And this is what gets people confused when you're in one belief and you're hearing four different ways. Yeah. So which one are you gonna pick? Which one is the right one? It's, it's up to interpretation, yeah. human interpretation, which is sometimes very faulty. Well, I think in... How you interpret things. Yeah, for, well, for the Christian one, for example, if you're missing information in the first place, you can't understand what you're hearing later down the line. Like mm -hmm. you said, they, they took out a lot of books. And if the information in those books pertain to what we know, what you would know as a Christian, then you need to find out what the books have in order to really know and what happens. And then another thing I want to bring up, every belief regardless of who you are. Even the Mayans in South Africa also, the Aztecs, Christianity, Muslims, Egyptian. This is just to name a few. They all talk about crossing the river mm -hmm. or crossing a body of water. Yeah. One has a bridge, which is the Muslim faith. And the bridge is over fire and brimstone, not a river. It's where the river was, but it's fire. Right. It states, if it's a vile soul that's trying to cross that river with the help of the Lord of Death and the messengers, mm -hmm. He will never cross that bridge. He will fall off the bridge into the fire. Okay. So that's like a one-way ticket to the hell. hell. And the Egyptians, and there are other ancient beliefs that when you die, they will place two gold coins on your ark on your eyes mm -hmm. and that's to pay the boatman to take you across the river mm -hmm. the body of water and it, he's called a pow pot mm -hmm. in egyptian right that's his name right that's his status okay and his job just is to take you across but the payment is the gold coins that's on your eyes. 
right. right? So when you start looking at different beliefs, the journey is a little different, but the end, either way, is the same. Yeah. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. You know, so I don't want people to get confused, right? But it's interesting to know. Now, in the Mayans... Or you want to get scared because it sounds like it's an inevitable journey that the soul has to make, right? It's not. It's like, not. No? No. What I mean, yes, it's going to happen. Like when you die. Right. Yeah. It's going to happen. But the time frame may vary to how you lived your life. So I want people to understand that when you pray to God, and I want to do that show too, why sometimes your prayers aren't answered. When you pray to God, why is it that when we pray, we're praying for something for earth? Good health on earth. Praying for your children on earth. Some people pray for money on earth. Some people pray for wealth, period, land, whatever, right? That prayers may not apply to now. It's for when you leave. And why would you want to pray for something materialistic? When if you have a direct connection with God, your life that was written before you're born, your life is predestined. Yeah. So why don't you make it simple and say, God, if it's your will and I deserve it, can you let what is predestined for me to come to me? If I'm fulfilling my part of my promise to you, you know, you can make prayers very simple. Yeah. Instead of asking for car, money, good job, X, Y, Z. Right? Is the purpose. When you say like the, the promise you made to go out to do something, like these kinds of things, right? Is it a material purpose? So when you make that promise to God, it's not about wealth or what you're going to have here. The reason you make a promise to God is if you have another chance to be born as a human, you could be born, and it says in the scriptures, millions and millions of other species on the earth. And I think it states 84 million species right. that's on the earth. So what I'm trying to say, we're glad to come back as a human. Why? We know what we did in our past lives. We got a lot of karma to, to get rid of. Right. And hopefully, you make a promise to God stating if you are born, you will do this, this, and this for humanity. You will do a lot of different things. But as we grow up, we're conditioned into the culture we're born in, the religion we're born in, the customs, the traditions of what we're born in, we forget the promise. Now we're taught human way. Mm. And human way, somehow, some way, not in all cases, they teach us to try to spro prosper, have wealth, have land, have X, Y, Z. Mm. That's a misconception. You can live good, but that's not your goal. And I was always told, and I've proved it, I've had top businessmen, they watch me shut my business down every Friday. And I take my people, we go do prayers on the beach, we're doing something, or we're training, teaching. And they say, how can you do that financially? Mm -hmm. And these are big people. I'll say, try it. You want to come next week? 
shut your whole operation down. Their mouth falls open. Yeah. I said, give God this little time and you'll see the, you'll reap the benefits for the next week and the week after and the week after, if you continue this mm. and they came, they shut down. And once they started, they said, it's true. They seen it with their own two eyes. They didn't believe it before. Yeah. Now, another thing that confuses people. Now, I know you've done, oh God, probably over a thousand recordings for different spiritual people. Yeah. And you hear during the satsang or remind, if you set and listen to this remind or read the remind, all your desires will be fulfilled. Is that spiritual? No. Or human? That's your mind. So why would we tell people to listen to gain materialistic things? My guru always told me, there's nothing wrong with having good things in your life, like a nice car, nice house, good job, great kids. And you could love people, but you can never be attached to what you have. You can enjoy it, but don't be attached to it. Haven't you seen guys that have a nice car and every day they're out there rubbing that car down, cleaning that car, and the wife is watching from the house saying, God, he don't rub me like that. You know, he's attached to that car. Yeah. So what would happen to him if he came out in the morning and somebody stole the car? and he can't get back. Is he gonna let that go? Saying, so be it, I'll get another one. He's not attached to it. Yeah. Attachment cannot even be to your loved ones. Why? Everything on earth is only temporary. Yeah. It's only during while you're living. When you leave here, none of that's going to you. And then your children, it's going to be temporary within their lifetime. And after four or six generations, your family may not even own that land anymore. Because technically the land that you live on, that you bought and have a deed, is not your land. Yeah. That land was here before humanity even came. When humanity leaves this earth, that land's still gonna be here, if the earth is still here. And even four or six generation, one generation, the land you yeah. fighting for today, when you children get it, they might sell it as well. They'll sell it. it for money. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say, no attachments during this lifetime. Attachments may ground you. Now you also have wandering souls on earth. Remember, I said you still have that free will of choice when you leave. Some souls, it is stated, may stay on earth due to a couple reasons. One, they're scared of what waits for them on the other side okay. when they complete their journey because they know what they've done. Some souls may stay here because when they have the divine, semi-divine sight, they may see a relative, a loved one is in danger. And they may stay down here trying to communicate, trying to give them signs to sway their decision or what's going to happen to help protect them. Mm -hmm. The other reason is the loved ones that you were with will not let go of you. Mm -hmm. They keep crying, saying, why did you leave me? Why have you gone? Why did you do this to me? Right? This is where detachment is critical during this lifetime. Yeah. You could love somebody, support them, be with them, everything. Some people's confused. How can you love someone but not be attached to someone? 
it's very easy knowing that she or he is going to leave and we don't know when that we shouldn't argue when they leave to go to work no matter what your dispute was you should make up before they go out to work why you never know what's going to happen when they leave like i said live your in the last show i said live your day like it's your last day right now so when they decide to stay they miss the boat and after 5 years they are grounded to earth they cannot leave earth and their energy changes into negative energy so i always tell people after the person has gone and if you're dreaming frequently that individual up to 5 years you better call cuz there is a ritual not a prayers that can release the soul to go on his journey so i've done hundreds and hundreds of these i've had people fly from france australia well, to come and do this what about well i think there's one more situation the ones that you say where people they are trapped like somebody traps them right now that's when obia occurs yeah and at funerals and cremation as soon as that soul breaks the body it's vulnerable right and i even said on the show that a lot of times people ask me to come and right before the body is cremated i do the ancient sumerian prayer which protects the soul when it leaves the body right but when i did on the one case there was a lady trying to pull the soul i could feel her energy yeah and then she sensed me she moved i moved to equal being direct line from her my wife was wondering what the heck is going on and she kept trying to pull that soul but i wouldn't let her pull the soul that was my job some people capture the souls and have them work for them on the earthly realm so and some people store souls in other people when they do certain rituals and the people don't even know it mm. and they call them out at night to do their work and the soul reenters back in their body you're like a storage center So we could have a whole show on that yeah. because this is actually happening. Yeah, on the island. I didn't get to finish everything on the journey of the soul because I wanted to go into um Egyptian, yeah, Mayans. So we may have a continuation again. But Yeah, hey, I had one question. Okay. Probably you could answer it in short where you know they say when the soul leaves the body i heard it from different people that if it leaves through the eyes or through the mouth if the soul leaves the body you go to a higher plane or if it leaves through the or they say the anus i believe the navel is a point too but if they leave through the lower extremities they go to a lower plane any truth in that some say that yeah um i was never taught that but i have to admit it's written and actually the way they're talking it can come out of any of the nine orifices of the body right okay ears nose eyes so we can say that that it's written mm mm-hmm. but again i don't think technically anybody knows from what you've done which orifice it's going to actually come out only the soul will know at that time cuz it's not broken down if it comes out of the nostril it means you're in a status if it comes out of the eye it's a status if it comes out your anus it's that status mm. it's not written okay okay 
So yes, the information can go out because yes, it is referenced, right? But I hope everybody that watched, this helped them out a little bit, gave them a little knowledge of other beliefs, and we may continue on. You know, because this is questions everybody has when they go to a cremation and funeral. Yeah. And it's been the question since the beginning of humanity when people die. Yeah. I think a big takeaway point is for them, for people to realize bawling and crying at a funeral don't help the soul. No. It ties it the soul down. It hurts the soul. Yeah. And you see that the Baptists, when they die, yeah. they rejoice. They throw a party. I had, I, They're happy because they know that soul in some time is going back home yeah. where it came from. I hear the Irish do the same thing. They have like a big drinking party or whatever. Yeah. When I was in Germany, afterwards you go, you eat, you're drinking beer. That's the way they're custom. Okay. So again, Omkar, it's been a pleasure being with you and putting out this information and you do ask a lot of good questions. And everybody listening, I hope this gave you a little information. We're going to continue on on the next week. And please, just live a good life. That's going to help you complete your journey when you leave here. Everybody, you have a safe evening and a safe week. And we will see you next week. Good night. God. Has any word in human history been more influential? Mankind has created religion after religion, written book after book, all in an effort to satisfy our quest for knowing God. Now after many millennia, mankind is more at a loss to the nature of God. In fact, it appears that the tools we created to help us find God serve more as obstacles and hindrances. Those obstacles now stand between God and us. We extend to you an invitation to join Master Eric and Omkar for the weekly program Between God and Us every Sunday evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. exclusively on Sankia Television Between God and us.